All right, good morning. Um, some of you talking about a multi-scalar approach to, uh, let me turn this one off so I'll get feedback. There we go. Uh, multi-scalar approach to monitoring uh, big rivers. And we're going to be looking uh, primarily at uh, channel narrowing. And so before I get started, uh, it's important that I acknowledge my uh, co-authors here. Uh, Michael Scott, which is he, he's an uh, outstanding riparian ecologist, uh, Dusty Perkins, and Joe Wheaton, uh, my supervisor and a geomorphologist. Uh, Dusty is uh, from the Park Service, and that's the funding agency for this project. And um, I'm coming from Utah State, uh, our eco-geomorphology and topographic analysis laboratory. So to give you an idea of what we're talking about with these big rivers, the Green, the Yampa, Colorado, and the Gunnison. And as an outline to what I'm be talking about, like motivations behind why we're developing a new protocol, and it's basically driven by resource threats and limitations of traditional monitoring methods. And this multi-scale or multi-scale, similar to what uh, Delight and Bruce have been talking about, these different lines of evidence to get at uh, your, your uh, protocol. So what we're using is remote sensing, so data that's available and opportunistically using it and leveraging it. And then doing uh, these rapid inventories, very rapid inventories we're calling Rapido. And as opposed to rapid, because there's also field-based rapid assessments, and then more detailed uh, field-based analyses, which we're calling sentinel sites, and then legacy sites. Those have been historically monitored. And then I'll talk a little bit about the results. This is most, mostly methods, just because that's where we're, we are in our progress, and a few summaries and implications. So getting started, one of the big threats is climate change. And it's real. It's happening. It's already happened. We've warmed uh, like about 0.8 degrees, and we're forecasted to warm, you know, another 3.6 Fahrenheit by uh, 2050. So within some of our lifetimes, maybe not mine, but maybe some of you out there, uh, we'll see these climate warming events. And so this is going to have dramatic impacts on the regional hydrology. And so what are some of those? Some of are kind of grim to think about. We're going to have reduced snowpack in the high elevation. So those skiers out there, the skiing is going to get less ideal. Uh, we're going to get shifts. We're going to have earlier runoffs. And so spring's going to happen earlier. And then by late summer, flows are going to be reduced. So overall, we're going to have this decrease in our water availability. And then we get this crazy thing where we're going to get more floods and more drought. And we've seen it in 2011. Like on the Yampa, you had the record high. And then the following year, you have the record low. So it's crazy stuff that's happening. But it's, these are real threats. And as resource managers, things that we need to, to uh, kind of come to terms with. And then also, kind of this double-edged sword, we got, we got these increasing demands for water. Uh, so say in the Rome Plateau or other areas in you know, all throughout Colorado and Utah, eastern Utah, western Colorado, you've got these. Uh, demands on water. For example, uh, for the Yampa, there's been, this is one particular bid for water, for water rights, for 15 million gallon water right on the Yampa. And so other diversions is an example of a diversion on the Green River. So we have these uh, pressures on our water resources. So what are the consequences? Uh, so we're going to get more droughts, larger floods, potentially. And we might have more droughts and no floods because of water development. So these are kind of the scenarios we have to kind of build um, our, our, mo our monitoring programs around, which can be difficult. But these are likely going to result in vegetation encroachment into these channels, uh, stabilization of the channel deposits, and then building the new floodplain surfaces by lateral and vertical accretion. And before we get too into this, I think it's important that we uh, actually look at what this means. And so this slide kind of describes it. So these are the, uh, say, we're talking about canyon-bound rivers here. So these are canyon walls. 
This is a mid-channel bar or island. This will be, say, a cross-section. So here we have fine sediment building up over time. And then we're progressing across here. So we're going from a multi-threaded uh, plain form to all the way here to where you're basically reducing, simplifying the channel. So a lot of us, uh, you know, when you read a textbook about rivers, you're saying, you know, if you stabilize a river, the banks of the river, that's typically good. But in these systems out here that have been, you know, wide, dry, uh, muddy systems, and they're built around change, this is not good. This simplification here is not what we're looking for. And, but this is what's happening, and as we build these surfaces, the vegetation follows. So the results are something like this here. So the idea is we're getting this an ecological response to reduced uh, stream flows that threaten these uh, big river canyon bound systems. And then as far as the uh, resource degradation that's associated with it, some of it's pretty obvious. Increased native vegetation, tamarisk, uh, Russian olive, uh, other invasive species come in, and this diminishes the habitat quality. And then as we get this reduction in uh, these channels, we get the simplification that reduces aquatic habitat. So the diversity of the aquatic habitat is greatly reduced. So now shifting gears a little bit. I talked about the threats, and now a little bit about the limitations of our traditional method. So typically what we've done um, over time is we've used uh, repeat uh, topographic surveys to get an idea. So we go to these fixed transects, for example, and we measure and we get really nice, rich temporal data for those specific areas. And this is great. The problem with it is it's really limited, spatially limited on where you can do this. It would be great if we could do it everywhere, but it's just too time consuming and expensive especially with uh, dwindling budgets that are reality. So the idea with the multi-scalar approach is you're introducing new methods, but the new methods you're introducing are cheap and reliable, and they're leveraging existing data sets and things that are uh, built around emerging technologies. So some other limitations of traditional methods, and you, we've all seen this photo before, and one of the limitations of repeat uh, historic photos there's just not that many of them. Um, it's a great example. It's a great photo showing this, you know, nice backwater habitat in the upper photo. You know, these nice bars, these uh, great spawning bars. In the next photo below, we see uh, tamarisk invasion. But you can't really guide uh, all all your changes just based on this. So they're they're great when they're available, but they're just very limited. And then um, finally, as far as the, the third kind of limited, this is kind of the third, what we see uh, historically using uh, these methods. So this is repeat ortho, uh, ortho photography. So for example, we have this time series from 1938 through 2010. We kind of can see this has changed on this uh, bar, this mid-channel bar, as far as vegetation over time. You know, it's great. It's great data. But once again, without getting on the ground and really drilling down, as Glenn and Bruce talked about, it's really hard to really know what's happening uh, geomorphology, geomorphically and then vegetatively. So that's kind of the driver between, uh, for a new uh, protocol to look at these rivers. So, you know, just to uh, restate it, so with these limiting budgets, with uh, resource concerns, and the shortcomings of the traditional methods, the National Park Service and the Northern Colorado Plateau Network uh, came up with funds to uh, build a new protocol. And it's, uh, it's largely based on um, past data that's been collected in the uh, Dinosaur National Monument on the Green and Yampa Rivers. A lot of work done by uh, Jack Schmidt and Paul Grams and um, uh, Cooper and others that have collected great data over the years in dinosaur, expanding that to other parks, uh, Canyonlands, and Black Canyon of the Gunnison, for example. So what is this multi-scalar approach? Basically, getting into it, 
the idea is we're looking at five different scales. So we're leveraging remotely sensed data that's available at kind of the broadest scale, and then also doing these park-wide field-based uh, rapido inventories that I'll describe, and then this rapid um, assessment where you're getting more, a little more intensive field-based, but you're not going to the level of these sentinel sites where those, these are the typical way that it's been done in the past where you're setting up a total station, you're doing very detailed quantitative measurements of, of uh, specific features. And then uh, lastly, we're looking at legacy. We're tying those legacy sites, those sites that have been monitored over time with the Sentinel sites. So what I'm going to do in the following part of the presentation is just kind of go through this, uh, driving it mostly by pictures to keep you guys awake. Uh, so first, and this can be applied to any of your guys' research, the idea is to take advantage of what's out there. And I noticed in the presentations, people are doing that. I think it's great. But I think dig deep into what's available. Utilize if there's uh, LIDAR available in your area, if there's mapping that's already done. Google Earth is an awesome resource. You can go back, you can look at historic time series with Google Earth. There's aerial imagery for all states with a NAEP program. It's usually a three to five year interval. Uh, MODIS and Landsat um, data, a lot of it's free. Uh, and a lot of the processing is not that difficult if you have a competent GIS person uh, that you can either in your office or you can hire out. So these are two examples. So um, here on the left, uh, this is Manners uh, 2013. Uh, she just finished her dissertation at Utah State. And she uh, mapped uh, Tamaris cohorts in uh, the Lador Canyon uh, based on 2010 multispectral imagery. So it's pretty neat what she was able to do is, you know, basically it's really labor intensive, but you're digging trenches down to the root and you're uh, measuring, um, you're aging, you're coring trees, cutting them down, counting tree rings, and you're getting the age of when they're established. That's one example. And another example, uh, in 1999, uh, Paul Grams did his uh, master's work on the Door Canyon. And he mapped out on Mylar 9x9 photos. You know, this is back in the day. When you, and traced them all out. And what was cool is we used the same data when we went out in the field in 2012. We put that on our iPad and went out and basically did what took Paul months. We did it in the field on a little tablet. And that's kind of where we've gotten in, you know, in our day and age. So we can do things a lot faster. So I think it drives us, if we can do things faster, we got to do more things, we got to do them better. And so it's kind of that driver. So one thing that we did, um, so this is a project that's just getting underway. So in the fall of 2012, one of the first things we did is we just pulled up Google Earth and we just looked at what we found in the imagery and we came up with just this really kind of crude uh, sensitivity rating from sensitive, meaning that there's uh, Basically, they're bare, bare channel uh, surfaces, uh, insensitive, where they were uh, uh, vegetated already, and very sensitive, they were being vegetated by uh, tamarisk and sandbar willow and other species that are indicators of uh, uh, channel narrowing. And so from that, we, in, in Dinosaur National Monument, we mapped out, in the area that I'm going to talk about in the, in the forthcoming slides, 64 of these geomorphic features we identified as uh, sensitive channel narrowing. And that took about two days to do uh, for the whole park. And then what we did is we used this Rapido method, and we stopped at each of these features, and we uh, completed a, a census. And so both those that we identified in the desktop inventory, but we also found others that we didn't identify that were new, and so we added them to the list. And so basically, the census is just to make sure we're not missing anything. One of the drivers for this Rapido was, OK, we've got these sentinel sites, but we only have uh, three or four of them per reach. We could be missing what's really happening on the larger river as a whole. And so you know, we go out. We have our lap, uh, little iPad there. And we just, we're taking three to five minutes, and that's including getting in and out of your boat. 
and we're collecting a simple data collection form. And this is what it really comes down to. You know, good science is largely uh, disguised, you know, largely work disguised as play. Um, and so the idea is we have this form that's uh, a custom form that's on the iPad. It takes two minutes or less to fill out. You're taking a GPS location of the site with the iPad. You're geotagging your photos. And you're also doing a photo synth, which is basically, I don't know how many of you, how many of you guys have done photo synth before? Raise a hand. Um, photo synth is really cool. It doesn't take any special equipment. It's just your camera. And what you do is you, sh you can just shoot. And what you can do after that is amazing. You can create uh, three 160 degree three dimensional photos just from that using, you can use this, uh, this URL right here. So it's a, this is a Microsoft system. And so what is produced from it is these immersible photos where you can uh, move in and out of. And it also creates uh, 3D point clouds. So it's poor man's LIDAR. And it's based on structure from motion is a photogrammetry uh, technique. And it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, we use it all the time for all, all our field sites. We use it on the Escalante. We've used it on the, uh, the San Rafael. And of course, here uh, in Dinosaur. So this is what our field form looks like. It's a mixture of uh, geomorphology and vegetation data. And this is what's collected in less than two minutes. The idea is you're getting at the idea of what's happening as far as, as uh, you know, as, as uh, Glenn talked in his talk about the geomorphology and what uh, uh, Bruce talked about in his as far as vegetation. But you're getting really quick data. You're getting a coarse um, overview of what that, what that site looks like. And the idea with the GPS and the photos is something that's repeatable over time. And so the idea is what we, what we came up with is if we go back, there were 64 sites we pre-identified. We, we almost doubled that when we were actually out on the ground and looking at things. And partially that was driven by the high water event that happened in the upper green in 2011 where there's actually a change from 2010 and there are new bars that had been formed, larger bars, and therefore there was uh, more to do. Okay, so as far as where we're at, I'm just going to run through this quickly. As far as the Rapidos, we're, we're feeling like we're getting data that's uh, reasonable, reasonably accurate. It's obviously not as precise as if you're there with a total station. And then onto the rapid uh, site assessment. So in the rapid, we're looking at like 30 sites per unit. And this is on a revolving panel. We do every four to six years. These take about an hour to do. We're doing a few vegetative and geomorphic change indicators at each of these sites. So on the vegetation side, what we did previously, this is Michael Scott's work. He looked at about 1,100 quadrats, and he found these indicators species of discrete surfaces. So what he came up with is basically on the active channel, uh, species like Indian hemp and common spike rush were indicators of channel narrowing. And then as we get into the active floodplain, a uh, horsetail and narrow cottonwood, and then the inactive floodplain, uh, species such as saltgrass. And then as far as the geomorph goes, we're focusing on uh, elevation, elevation change. So we're just mapping out uh, the, these particle sizes, dominant particle sizes. And then we're doing facies mapping really roughly going around with a handheld GPS. And mapping, for example, if there's a sand cap on a gravel bar, that's uh, important to know because that, that could be an indicator of uh, potential uh, recruitment by uh, species. So we're also mapping out the bar features. And for example, in this slide, they were mapping out the, uh, the wetted area and the active channel and then as far as uh, these bar surfaces. That's what you can do with a, just a regular GPS. So moving on to the sentinel sites, uh, just for time's sake, uh, three sites per river segment. So say that gates a little door section would be three sites. And so these are, these are areas that are picked to be sensitive. And they, in these areas, we're doing uh, very refined uh, geomorphic and vegetation change uh, detection. 
So we're doing uh, veg plots. We're doing this using what we call this CHAMP protocol that I'll describe in a minute, and uh, more detailed facies mapping. And these are annually. These take about a half a day to a day. And so on the central sites, we're doing uh, veg plots. And you have, you, you know, in this case, you have to have a botanist on board, somebody that knows their plants in the area very well. And you're looking at bare ground, total plant cover, and then percent cover by uh, species. And then you're getting a list of uh, species uh, for that particular plot. And then the, the facies mapping. So basically what you're doing there is every distinct sedimentary unit you're mapping out. And then you're also uh, mapping out and delineating these deposition areas and the particle size um, in these active uh, channel features. And tracking this size, once again, if you know where these fine grained sediments are, those are, you know, the, that's where the, the new vegetation is going to come. So having that information, you can, you can provide an early indicator of where channel narrowing is likely to occur. And I talked about this CHAMP protocol a little bit, but basically this is built on, on a protocol they're doing in the Columbia River Basin where the mapping is, uh, you're mapping out a continuous surface of the channel topography. And so these kind of outline some of the placements that the, the, the NAMD or the rod person would be hitting. So you're actually trying to capture these features. So it's strategic placement of the rod and getting a really nice uh, representation of the surface. And then similar to what Bruce described in his talk about uh, change detection over time, we're taking our our new DM and uh, myosin from our old and getting this uh, dam of difference, DM of difference. And uh, we have special software that we've developed in our lab that actually accounts for the noise within each of those data sets and then comes up with uh, your elevation changes, whether it's depositional or erosion. And once again, the deposition would be in blue and the erosion in red. So in this example, you'd have erosion here and deposition. And so the beauty of this is within these algorithms, you're actually taking into account your, say this is a, a LIDAR flight and this is a LIDAR flight. Each of these are going to have errors associated with them. With uh, this software, you're actually accounting for those errors. And so just kind of wrapping up, so we have these different lines of evidence. Uh, they're scale-based. So from the bottom up, you know, we have this park-wide desktop and field-based inventories. And then building on that, where available, we'll have this leverage remote sensing data. And then we'll have these rapid sites where you might have 30 to 40 per uh, reach. Say the reach, in this case, when I say a reach, I'm talking, you know, maybe 100 miles. And these detailed uh, sentinel sites where you're having three to four per uh, per reach, and then the legacy sites, those areas that have already been uh, studied over time or integrated with the sentinel site. So these things overlap each other. And so you're, you're drilling down, but you're also getting uh, park-wide or reach-wide data. So in summary, so wrapping up here, so we're in the phase of designing and implementing and testing our monitoring system. And, and to make it cost effective and transferable to other canyon bound systems. So right now we're focusing on canyon bound systems. We're also going to integrate it into the park uh, systems as well, the, the parkland systems. And then using this, this approach as I've described is you can go from site specific up to the broad scales. And so the hope is that we'll be able to have early detection and quantifiable information on channel narrowing that will help the Park Service uh, negotiate with water users as far as when there's uh, basically what it comes down to, the Park Service doesn't want to lose their water right. And they want to be able to negotiate, and they want to be at the table, and they want to have good data that shows uh, the resource degradations that are associated with channel narrowing. And through this approach, if we can identify those sensitive areas of narrowing, we can narrow things down areas that are most likely to be uh, impacted and therefore have a more cost-effective approach. As far as if you want more information, uh, joeaton.org uh, is our, the link to our uh, lab site. And it's actually a pretty rich uh, data source. 
Uh, we've actually got links to software we've developed. The change detection software is in there. Uh, it's downloadable for free. For those people that are working with LiDAR data sets or other data, that's really good. And there's also more information on kind of these emerging technologies like Photosynth and other things. And that's it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>